Corinthians chapter 1. Last week, I began uh, talking about the moonshot. And just to refresh you on that, in case you didn't hear that, the moonshot was what President Kennedy, in May of 1961, encouraged the United States to try and do, to get a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And it was a visionary uh, uh, attempt because, remember, at this point, we hadn't even put a man in space. The Russians had put a man in space. We hadn't done that. And getting to the moon by the end of the decade really seemed impossible. And and we talked about how by the time you got to July, I believe it was July 20th of 1965, 1969, that we actually landed man on the moon and we saw the moonshot, the seemingly impossible, come to pass. And we talked about how if God or if, if the United States could put their mind to that, how much more can we as a church with the creator of the universe helping us attempt and expect great things from God. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about in that was, that was the big picture, that was the vision, if you will, of putting the man on the moon or putting a man on the moon. But there was a lot that went on behind the scenes for that to happen. It wasn't that Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And everybody talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And then you got to the end of the decade and all of a sudden we put a man on the moon. No, there was a lot that went into it. You had the military, everybody working from that perspective. You had NASA, thousands of people working for NASA. You had the engineers who were working to make a spacecraft that could go into orbit and then could survive coming back. You had the mathematicians. Uh, They didn't really have computers that they could rely on to do the calculations. Most of the calculations were done by hand at that point. You had the astronauts who were willing to risk their lives to go into space to accomplish this. You had the astronauts' wives who were willing to let their husbands risk their lives to go into space. And we know that some of them actually gave their lives for that. But what happened in all of that was, for that moonshot to happen, you had different people from different places who came together, united and undeterred, For one cause, you could put it this way, side by side, striving together for the main goal that they were attempting to reach. If if we, in the past, as a nation, were able to do that to accomplish this main goal that we were trying to reach, how much more important is it for us as a church to seek to be united undeterred, and focused on the main thing. And let me tell you, church, it's so important that we stay focused on the main thing. Because if we don't, we'll have lots of small things that will pull away from the mission. We'll have lots of small things that will divide us. We have to stay focused on the main thing. And that's what Paul is going to say here in Philippians chapter 1. It is his biggest desire for these people. The only thing that he wants to hear from this church, the church in Philippi, is that they have been united and undeterred in reaching or in progressing the gospel in their area. Let's begin reading in chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 12. And uh, we're actually going to look at verse 12 through the end of the chapter today. Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, says, I wanted you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. 
For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightening anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us through your word today. Lord, I don't want my flesh anywhere near this. I don't want my opinions anywhere near this. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would magnify Christ and that you would turn our eyes to Him and to the mission that He has given us. I thank you that you hear and that you help. I trust because I've asked that you'll fill me with the Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul, as he writes here in Philippians, he is writing believers that are facing two big issues. The first issue is is that they are facing some blowback for their faith in Jesus Christ, for the way that they live the gospel in their community. We actually saw that in verses 28 through 30. He says, you are suffering now. There is this hardship that has come to you because you are a follower of Christ. One of the other issues that's going on is when you get to chapter 4, verse 1, verses 1 through 3 in there, he's he's talking about there are two ladies in the church. Uh, uh, Syntyche is one of them, Neodius is the other one, and there is some division that's there. And, And he wants them to come to peace, and he doesn't want that to spread throughout the rest of the church. And underlying all of this is Paul's desire to be with them But he can't be. He can't be with them because he's in prison. More than anything, he wants to come alongside them and strengthen them and confirm them and encourage them and to build them up personally. It's not something that he's able to do. And so he's concerned that these two things could consume this church and take their focus off of what was really important. See, every church faces this hurdle. Every church can face this challenge. You know, last week, Sunday morning and Sunday night, I spoke about some of the realities that we face as a church. We can, as a church, let those realities dominate our focus, or we can let them drive us back to the main thing as our focus. In other words, it's easy to look at your circumstances and let that consume all of your energy instead of it driving you back to the main thing. First of all, Jesus Christ, and then the mission that he's given us. And as Paul begins to work through the first part of this book here, he's encouraging them to stay focused on the main thing. Well, what is the main thing? believe the main thing in this context, and in light of what we saw last week, and even as we look at the, continue to look at the New Testament, the main thing is this. We must pursue united, undeterred gospel faithfulness. United, undeterred gospel faithfulness. This is something that Paul exemplified in his life. And he gives us three examples from his own life of how the gospel continued to progress and how that was his priority even when his situation was bad. Now, look at how Paul does this. This is so so neat to me, what he is encouraging these believers with here. 
Paul's life shows us our main priority. His priority was gospel progress. That's what we see in verses 12 through 26. Instead of letting circumstances knock them off track in advancing the gospel, Paul shows them his heart. And he shows them the heart that they should have, the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing. Notice, first of all, Paul says prison was good if the gospel was advancing. This is counter to what we believe and what we think. We think that sickness, we think that prison, we think that hardship, we think that suffering, we think that blowback, we think that all of those things are bad. But Paul says, if that somehow or another causes the gospel to advance, I'm good. Even if I'm in prison. Look at how he says it in verses 12 through 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of my brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He writes from prison, and the human view is this is bad because the missionary is not working. This is bad because the missionary ought to be out planting churches. This is bad because we would like the missionary here with us in Philippi, helping us personally. But Paul, Paul's not sore about it. As a matter of fact, he's remarkably calm and grace-filled about it. Well, why is that? Well, there are two things that have happened. Because of Paul's imprisonment, first of all, the palace is being evangelized. He says the whole imperial guard is now hearing of Christ. Now, the imperial guard, there's some different discussion what this could be. This was a group of 800 to 1,000 soldiers who protected Caesar and the palace. And there could have been a smaller detachment. But what we know was probably happening here was that Paul was under house arrest. And in all likelihood, there was a Roman soldier, a, part, a member of this imperial guard who was with him in his house all the time, and possibly even chained to Paul all the time. And they would switch those guards in and out. That means that over and over and over, different members of the Imperial Guard were with Paul, day in and day out, Uh, for a space of about, we think about two years here. That means that routinely, these guards were coming in, and what do you think they were hearing about? Do you think they heard Paul complaining about his circumstances? Do you think they heard Paul moaning and whining about how unfair it was that he'd been accused back in Israel of all these crimes that he hadn't actually done and he'd had to appeal to Caesar to save his neck? Do you think that's what they heard from Paul? No, they were hearing about the grace of Jesus over and over, so much so that the entire guard had either cycled through and heard Paul talk about Jesus, or they had had some of the imperial guard hear about Jesus and they were telling their uh, fellow soldiers about Jesus because of what Paul had said. He shows them here that the bad in the prison was okay because the gospel was being advanced. The other thing that happened, Paul says, is that the saints were growing bolder because of this. This is what they're thinking. Wait a minute. Paul is in prison, and he's being faithful to the gospel. We are out of prison. Why can't we also be faithful to the gospel and in sharing the gospel? And this is what Paul says. The saints, look at it down in verse 14. And most of the brothers, I think he's talking about there in Rome, most of the brothers have become, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. If Paul could be faithful inside, they could be faithful outside the prison. But Paul, again, is saying this is okay for one reason. And that reason is found up in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So what does this tell us? Paul is saying, I don't care what happens to me as long as the gospel is progressing. That's the most important thing to me. 
This word advancing is interesting. It means uh, scouts who go ahead and clear the way. And Paul is saying, me in prison, I'm clearing a path for the gospel to be effective. And if that is what it means to be in prison for the sake of the gospel, then I'm happy for that. So to Paul, prison was good if the gospel was advancing. The second thing that he shows us here is that pretense was fine if the gospel was progressing. So he's in prison, the gospel's still going out, and in prison there's a situation that has arisen. In verse 15, notice how he says it, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Paul's in prison. He's not visiting churches. And what has happened in many of these churches is maybe there is a power vacuum. And there are people who are taking advantage of it. Paul can't visit, so they are stepping up. And they are trying to assert their will and to do it their way. And Paul says that there, in my absence, there are people who are preaching Christ out of love. Love for me and pure love for the gospel. Now, if that happens, are you happy about that, Heather? I'm happy about that if that happens. If people are preaching the gospel out of love and out of pure motives, I think all of us would ultimately be grateful for that, ultimately be happy for that. But there were some who were trying to take Paul's place out of rivalry. In other words, to establish their own power and to do it their way. And Paul says very specifically that it is because of selfish ambition. It was about them, not ultimately about the gospel, not ultimately about Christ. It was out of pretense, he says. It wasn't wasn't sincere. And they were even trying to hurt Paul. And what does Paul say? Paul says, I'm okay with that. As long as the gospel is progressing. Notice how he says it. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. See, the power of the gospel doesn't depend on the character of the preacher. Now, the character of the preacher can be a barrier to people believing the gospel. But it, is, it does not leash or chain the power of the gospel in any way. And these people, whatever their motives were, they were still getting up and they were proclaiming Christ in Paul's absence. And Paul was like, the gospel is going out. I'm happy with that. So do you see the pattern that's beginning to emerge here? Paul doesn't care what's happening to him. He doesn't care the hardship. He's got one goal and one goal alone. The main primary goal, and it's the main primary goal of our church, and it's the main primary goal of every church, and that is the gospel goes out effectively from our midst. So prison was good if the gospel was advancing. Pretense was fine if the gospel was progressing. And then Paul gives us one other thing. Heaven could wait if Christ was proclaimed. Now, I'm not going to read all of verses 19 through 26 again, but get the picture here. Paul has been sitting in prison. He's been sitting in prison for several years for crimes that he ultimately did not do. He's facing possible death. He knows that he could end up before Caesar and that Caesar could say off with his head and he dies. How would you feel sitting in prison for two years? Older like Paul, your body hurting from all the beatings that you've taken. Would you possibly think sometimes it would be nice to go see Jesus? It would, it would be nice if God would go ahead and call me home, or if we just get to the end of this here and we find out what's going to happen, and I end up in the presence of Christ. Maybe you would want to go see Jesus. Paul did. Paul's like, I want to go be with Jesus in this. His quandary was this, stay in the flesh and live. Because if he stayed in the flesh and live, uh, live, that could bring about 
fruitful labor. Look at verse 22. For if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. But then he gives a quandary. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. Amen. It is. That is far better. To be loosed from the trials and heartaches of this life and to be in the presence of Jesus, there is nothing that could be better than that. So his quandary is more spreading of the gospel, more building up of the saints, or to go be with Christ, which is the best option that's out there. How, how about you? I mean, today, if you could go see Jesus or stay here, which would you choose? I think and I've talked about this in some different ways, I think sometimes your, your age changes that perspective a little bit. I remember when I was 14, I used to be terrified that the rapture was going to happen, not because I was afraid of Jesus coming back. I just had a lot of living that I wanted to do. And I thought that 14 was too young to go out of this world. And I remember praying when I was 14, Lord, just hang off on the rapture till I graduate from high school and get married. Okay, Lord, just just let me get married. And after I got married, Lord, could you just hold off until I get until we have kids? Six kids later, later, I'm like, Lord, you can come back anytime. It is it is all right. There are some days it's like right now, this moment. Come on. And and even as I get older and and I see the brokenness in this world that's around us, I've got family. I'm I'm not ready to leave, but I understand the longings for heaven and I understand Paul's quandary here. And Paul is very specifically saying, though, that heaven could wait if it meant Christ being proclaimed. There was only one reason. He wanted fruitful labor for Christ and seeing their progression in the faith. Look at verse 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. He says Christ is going to be proclaimed The gospel is going to progress through you, through me. If I stay here, Jesus is going to receive glory. So I'm willing to stay here on this earth if that's what this means. Paul's prime passion was the progress of the gospel. What he's telling us here is, if I'm to endure all of this for the advance of the gospel, prison, pretense, staying here on this earth and this life, then there's something that I really want to hear from you. There's something that I really want to be true of you. The one thing he wanted to hear from them was that his desire was their gospel focus. This was ultimately his goal. His desire was their gospel focus. Look at verse 27, how he says it. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. He, he starts verse 27. Here's his application of what he's saying up in verses 12 through 26. All right, I've told you My primary desire is that the gospel goes out. I don't care what happens to me. And so he gives the application here. Only let. When he says only let, he's saying there's one thing. This is the main thing. This is the needful thing. This is the thing that I want to hear any more than anything else from you. It's like when I send uh, one of my kids to the store driving. They're driving my vehicle, and maybe it's near the end of the week, and the gas is a little bit low, and you know we're trying to maintain our gas budget. I'm like, I only want you to go to Walmart. Take the shortcut there, take the shortcut back. We don't need to be joyriding all over Greenwood County on the way to, Green, on the way to Walmart and on the way back. I've had my kids before take my car to go to Walmart, and it's three miles there, and it's three miles back, and I go and I look at their odometer, and I've had 40 miles go off. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? Oh, I went to Walmart, and I came straight back. Paul is saying, the only thing I want you to do, <laughs> the only thing that I want to hear is that you have, or that you are 
uh, living for the main thing, for the main purpose. His heart's desire was fourfold. He wanted to hear that they were living as heavenly citizens. Now, he says something interesting here. Look at this. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. This word manner of life means conduct as a citizen. Uh, let your conduct as a citizen. Well, we've got to ask the question, citizen of what? Is he talking about the citizen of a nation? Well, later on in chapter 3, he talks about our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. And so he says, I want to hear that you are living your life worthy of a citizen of heaven. I want your eye to be on the ball for the kingdom of Jesus first, not the kingdom of man. Church, it is, it is so easy for the kingdom of man and the kingdom of this earth and even our, our, the, the kingdom that we're a, a citizen of now, our earthly citizenship, it is so easy for it to rise in importance over the kingdom of God. It seems so much more urgent it seems so much more important, especially as people tell you every two years this is the most important election we've ever had in the history of mankind. And every two years we hear the same thing. And, and, and I think that we tend to believe it and we become consumed with that. We can't confuse the two. We have a dual citizenship, but it's not an equal citizenship. Our citizenship in heaven is so much higher and so much more important than our earthly citizenship. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 6 that we should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. It's easy for the earthly kingdom to overshadow and consume the heavenly kingdom. You know, um, I don't believe in anything, ever talking about anything controversial from the pulpit, ever. I was really sad a week and a half ago to see... Jesus saves signs and crosses drug through the capital of the United States by people who are engaging in sinful wickedness. Something was wrong in that. There was some major confusion that was going on in that. Heavenly citizenship is our greatest priority, and that doesn't entail making any earthly nation great. If it takes over the main thing. How many Christians have been more worried about election results than they have about the souls of their community? If our earthly citizenship overshadows our call to make disciples, are we really living worthy of the gospel? See, that's what Paul says here. Let your manner of life, your citizenship, the way that you live as citizens, be worthy of the gospel. What does that mean, worthy of the gospel? It means that our lives would be in line with the work and nature of the gospel, the humility of Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, His forgiveness, and His grace that He offers to all. That's what our lives should line up with. That's the citizenship that we should ultimately bring to the top and pursue more than any other. Paul wanted to hear that they were living as heavenly citizens. He also wanted to hear that they were standing firm in unity. They weren't backing up. They weren't backing down. That they were staying in their place and that they were united in what they were doing. They were making a stand for the gospel, not retreating from its youth, from its truth. Unity has the idea of one mind, one soul. Now, I've got to make an important distinction about unity here. Uh, there are churches today who would tell you that to be united, that you have to agree on everything. And so what they'll do is, is they'll have a very detailed statement of faith. Nothing wrong with a detailed statement of faith. Then they'll have a lot of rules and procedures and standards that you have to follow. And they expect you to follow all of those. And if you don't follow all those to the T, then you're causing dissension and you are not united. We are talking about unity for the main thing 
not uniformity. There are people who want to bring about uniformity in every church where everybody thinks the exact same way about every issue. And it's usually the way that the pastor thinks about it. I recognize the priesthood of the believer. And I recognize that our unity ultimately needs to be around the main thing. So many differences that people have in churches, and that's fine. That, that's good for us to have those. It's those differences that help us come together and welcome different people in because we're all not uniform. We're all not the same. We've all got different backgrounds and even different beliefs, but we're finding a way, even as we disagree on some of the smaller things, to come together for the big thing, for the cause of Christ. This means that if we're going to have unity, that we can't be passionate about preferences. We've got to be passionate about the main thing. Um, I, I'm grateful this is not the case in our church. I, I know of churches, and I've heard them, where people are passionate about the music, the preferences they have in the music, as if, you know, when they come in, that uh, everything that happens in that has to line up with their tastes. Uh, they are passionate about the decor in the church and, and, and um, it being the way that they want it. Um, they are passionate. I'm not going to give the church. I've got a friend who pastors a church in a community. I won't say what community it is, but he's got a lady in his, uh, in his church who holds a particular position, and they've been working on a church directory. And this particular position is not one that normally goes in the church directory. They only put committees in the church directory. And this is, uh, this is something that's really not an official thing in the church. They just asked her to do. And she, every week, is coming to this pastor and demanding that her name be put in the upcoming church directory as the leader of that particular area. And he's like, it is all the time. Every time I say, why can't you do this? Why can't you just put me in here? And, and he's just not, not giving in to it. Unity is where we lay preference aside on things that are ultimately aren't uh, important. We're not talking about doctrinal issues. Okay, we are supposed to stand fast in that truth. Uh, you've heard me talk about the different tiers of issues. You've got the first tier issues. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is where I can look at somebody else who might be different from me. Let's say a Presbyterian who's going to sprinkle their babies. And I can look at them and say, if you trust Jesus and Jesus alone, you're my brother. We can eat together. It's going to be hard for us to do church together. But I welcome you as a brother and I love you as a brother. Your second tier is going to be what you need in order to exist as a church. Do so we have the same view of baptism? Uh, do we have the uh, same view of uh, the gospel and, and how that works out in our lives? Do we basically have the same view about the way that government and the church should work and things along those lines? And then you've got the third tier issues that are just preferences. It is, doesn't make you a valid church one way or another if you do those things or not. And so unity is, especially on the church level, are those big picture things that we need to exist together as a church in order to move the ball forward as far as the gospel is concerned. That is unity and purpose for the glory of Jesus, the spread of the gospel and making of disciples. So Paul wanted to hear that they were living as heavenly citizens, that they were standing firm in unity. Then he wanted to hear that they were striving together as one team for the gospel. Notice how he says it here, verse 27. With one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. I'm not going to go deep into this because when we come back to this theme later on this year, we're going to look at the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, there's this phrase that keeps popping up. In the old King James, it puts it this way, one accord. But it keeps popping up. Uh, they were united. Another way you could say it is they had one mind. They had one will. They were passionate about the same thing. This is why the gospel has to be first and foremost, and progressing the gospel, advancing the gospel, has to be first and foremost, because we can only be passionate all together about so many things. 
You know, there are things that I do in my life that none of you would want to be passionate about. We can only be passionate, one mind, about a few things. Let's make those the important things. Paul, he wants to hear that they are thinking the same way, that they are acting the same way about the most important thing, and that is advancing the gospel. You know, there are two things that come to mind as I think about this phrase that he uses here. He is telling them that they need to be side by side, shoulder by shoulder for the gospel. Not for politics, not for a ministry, that, uh, not for ministry empires and recognition, not for preeminence and fame, not for tradition, for the gospel. Side by side. In 1965, you had a, uh, a group of people in response to a young black American who had been shot. Uh, they were attempting to march in Alabama to the capital in Montgomery. They got to this bridge. It was the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which was named after a Confederate brigadier general <laughs> and uh, Alabama Ku Klux Klan leader. It's kind of ironic that they end up on this bridge for this. And as they begin to go over the bridge, because of the way the bridge arched, they didn't know that on the other side of the bridge, at the foot of the bridge, there was an army of policemen who were waiting for them. And as they came to the top, the crest of the bridge, they saw that, and they had a decision at that point. Are we going to peacefully continue our march? Our arms locked side by side? Or are we going to abandon this main important thing to us? And they peacefully walked across the bridge. They were attacked. They were beaten. It went all over the country, all over the news. And it was one of the things that ended up turning beliefs about black Americans being able to vote and them having the right to vote in this country. There were other instances in that movement to where they decided not to rise up with guns and weapons, but to just link arms and side by side progress for what was important. That was important. It's not as important as the gospel. It, is, it was Paul's desire. If Paul could hear back from Greenwood Baptist Church, it would be Paul's desire that we would be living as heavenly citizens, that we would be standing in firm unity, and that we have our arms linked together side by side as one team working for the most important thing, and that everything else that comes in the way of the most important thing goes by the wayside. Another instance I think of where you see this type of unity side by side wasn't linking arms across a bridge. It was played out over several miles of ocean and several miles of coast as the Allied forces invaded France at Normandy. And uh, one of the things that they did, I read a book last summer on, on everything that transpired that day. One of the things that they did was they all would set their clock at the exact same time so they could all move at the exact same time to accomplish the goal. So they were all on the same page. And I guess in a way, as we prayed last week, as we continue to pray, I'm asking us as a church to set our clock by the same time, by the same thing, so that we move the same way. And it would be, Lord... Would you help us be effective in the harvest? Help us reach our community. God, you've got to help us. We're united in this. We're ready to do whatever you want. We're ready to make any sacrifice that you want to make, that you want us to make. But God, use us to advance and to progress the gospel in Greenwood. side by side, striving for the main thing, the gospel. Then the final thing that he wanted to hear was that they were undeterred by hardship. Now in their case, it was persecution. 
They, they had people that were causing physical suffering because they were walking with Christ. Philippi was a Roman colony. They were citizens. But they also had temples to the Roman gods there. When the Christians didn't go in those and worship the Roman gods, they were facing blowback for that. And, and Paul says, it's going to be easy for you to be frightened by your opponents. This is why you've got to be in this together. We don't need any lone wolves in this. We all got to be in this together so that we're not in any way frightened by our opponents. Look, the, the, the interpretation of that is if you're in the middle of persecution, you shouldn't be frightened. You've got each other there. We're not in the middle of persecution, but we are in some ways in the middle of hardship. And the thing that we can't do is let that scare us. We can't let that frighten us. We can't ultimately let it worry us. It should encourage us to have our eyes on the result, our glory, when we see Jesus. His glory on this earth as we follow Him and obey Him. You know, the application for this, Paul is looking at them, it's been granted for you to suffer for the sake of Christ. Suffer for His sake. Because of the conflict you're in. The application for that, for us, I believe, is that we shouldn't be uh, deterred by any current trouble. By any current circumstance that we find ourselves in as a church. That we should press the kingdom forward. That we should be united. Undeterred. And... Surrendered to and pressing forward the gospel in our community. What does this mean for us? Let me give you, let me give you three things that I think we can take, a, uh, take home and we can take away from this. First of all, to do what we did last Sunday night, and that is, Lord, would you keep us united? Lord, would you build our desire to link arms and to strive side by side for the gospel in our community? Number one, pray for unity. Number two, church. Decide to keep the main thing the main thing. It's the way that we stay of one mind. Because if we keep the main thing the main thing, we don't have to sweat the small stuff that typically drives people apart. Keep the main thing the main thing. And for us to pray, Lord, whatever it takes for us to reach our community, that's what we want. We want to accomplish the main thing that you've given us. And then the final thing is to pray for gospel progress. Paul says, I don't care my circumstances, I don't care prison, I don't care preaching, uh, uh, pre- preaching with pretense, uh, I don't care that I have to say on this earth, I just want the gospel to progress. And we ought to pray, Lord, I don't care circumstances here, I don't care about my will, I don't care what I want, I just want the gospel to progress. Lord, would you make that possible through us? If you don't mind, heads bowed, eyes closed. Lord, I'm thankful for the truth that you've given us here. I'm thankful for the clear eyes, the clear vision that Paul had. The vision of willing to endure anything. Willing to put himself and his agenda, and his desires aside for the progression of the gospel. And Lord, I want to be that way. Lord, I submit to you publicly, even as I've done this week, and ask that you would put my agendas to the side, and my will to the side, and that you would lead us clearly as a church. Lord Jesus, that you would be the head of this church, and that we would exist for your glory alone, and exist to impact the harvest alone. I pray for unity. I pray that you would keep us undeterred 
by any present trouble. I pray that you would keep us striving together and that we would be willing to put preference aside for the main thing. I thank you that you hear and that you help. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.